Welcome to the Accounting Profits and Prosperity Show. I am your host, Louis Prosperi. Today, we have a great guest. He is the partner in charge of advisory from Anders CPA Advisors. Welcome to the show, David Hartley. Let's start with uh, having the honest know a little bit about yourself because you've had a You've been in the CPA world. You went back to technology. Now you're back in. So give us a little bit of a, of a background on why would you want to come back after you leave? That's a good one. I think that, we would love to know that. that that's actually, that's <laughs> a good question. And I have gotten that before. Uh, so yeah, so I started a uh, degree in accounting, passed the CPA exam, decade of big four, started an audit, shifted to consulting. Um, and then, uh, then, yeah, I got an opportunity really to, I started doing more technology projects and, um, one of my clients was a public company and their CIO was retiring. And so I asked, what do you need in your next CIO? And they described me and I said, okay, well, let's talk about that. So I went there and I did that job for six years and it was a phenomenal experience. And then when I left there, one of the things that is unique about the CPA world is the CPA firm culture. And right. I, I really miss it. I love the fact that you're constantly on different teams. You're you know getting to experience different things. Uh, no two assignments are the same. So I gradually came back to the CPA world. And about five years ago, I joined Anders CPAs and Advisors, where I lead advisory uh, for the, the the practice today. And that was part of the reason why I came back, because my roots were in the CPA world. And, uh, and I love technology. But what I'm doing now in my role at Anders and with clients is sort of bringing that technology, what I learned, and some of the technology thinking back to the CPA world. So in our advisory practice, what we do in technology is pretty big part of our advisory practice. So, fantastic. So that so we're going to hit a lot of key topics that we're going to hit advisory, technology, and and uh, CFO work. So this is going to be a very good conversation, um, and I'm going to enjoy this a lot. So let's start with the the elephant in the room, which is probably AI. I'm sure it's something that is is a little bit scary for for professional accountants right now but also a little bit exciting because there's a lot of potential to enhance our ability to provide better service uh, uh probably and reduce the amount of time and energy related to maybe research and and that sort of thing can you explain to us what you think where ai is going and where it is now yeah i, I think that natural first reaction of things that are new and different we're frightened of and, and I right. think there's a lot of people. Actually, I just read a study yesterday. So as of February 2024, nearly yeah. uh, over three quarters of Americans have never tried ChatGPT. So there is a okay. huge percentage of our population that, there, you know, there's a small group that's using it and, and yeah. embracing it. And then you've got a whole lot of other people who are sitting outside of it and there's massive media coverage. And but yet they've never tried it. So. So I do think it's going to be significant, um, and I do think firms, firm leaders, need to be intentional, intentional about making it a priority for their firm. And so, you know, so but how do you do that? So yeah. I think there's really three things from my perspective. The first is you have to educate yourself on this stuff, and that doesn't mean you need to understand all the in depth, but you got to understand what the technology conceptually is. Um, and and read the articles. A lot of times you're like, well, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that and I'll read that article at some point. Well, but you need to make the time, you need to make it a priority, and you need to actually read it and consume it. Um, and then as you educate yourself, hopefully that fear starts to come down. So that that would be step number one. Step number two, I think, is is you really need to leverage your digital natives because there are people in your firm who are going to be more comfortable with this technology. And right. so as a result of that, it used to be, I think, in CPA firms that all the power was at the top and sort of as you went up through basically, you know, you were you, you knew you knew all at that point when you kind of made it to the top. What I'm experiencing as I've gone through my career is now new people coming into the firm solve problems very differently than I do. And they think very differently. And so uh, a lot of times I'll take things to them. I want them to experiment with new things, give feedback on it, all those types of things. So I think the, the digital natives is, is a big part of it. Um, step three, from my perspective, is you got to start trying some of this stuff. So um, so pick a tool, and it really doesn't matter which tool, kind of whatever your favorite is. But you know, there's a lot of AI note-taking tools that are very easy to just subscribe, invite to your meeting, and suddenly you get this amazing recap 
of the meeting, to-dos, action items, some pretty amazing stuff. Microsoft's right. got Copilot out there. Pretty much, you know, the vast majority of folks are, are Microsoft customers. So you could yes. add in Copilot and get a small team to start experimenting with that. So I think you, you have to try it. You have to educate yourself. You've got to leverage your digital natives. And then you just got to try it. And that's when I think it gets even more significant. Because right now, ChatGPT is this thing that's out there, but it's right. not really integrated. Copilot right. is starting to integrate it. That's where okay. the big leap in value is going to come. So the, I think the one that, that that comes to mind, like if I was back in an accounting practice and doing it, and using any type of AI, because the, the concern about AI is security, open source. Um, now, I, I love, I use, by the way, the note taker stuff as well. So I, I love that part of it. I think that's great because it, it it allows me when I'm doing meetings and Zoom meetings or whatever to just send them the transcript and send them the recording and it's all there and they can pick and choose. So I love that part of it. But what about with regards to customer data or financial data? Or analysis, where where is it right now? Is it still not? Is it still in the infancy range, or is there some te technology that you can utilize? Where is it from that perspective? So, number one, I think that's a great topic. And actually, one of the barriers that I see, which applies to CPA firms too, but you know, we talk with clients and they start their AI journey, and suddenly they realize, oh, we don't have our data secured. And so, right. if you tell one of these tools to go out and pull, you know payroll information or whatever, yep. it'll dutifully go out and do it. So you've got to make sure you've got your walls set up appropriately and you really have thought through security. But I, I would say we're in our infancy on that Okay. Um, in, in terms of, because a lot of people haven't done a lot of that, that legwork and homework. And you do have to educate yourself on, you don't want to put something in a tool that you don't want publicly available if that's what's going to happen. But there are more and more things with Copilot where you can now start doing things in your own instance. And therefore, you can start doing some of these things like like my ultimate dream for our virtual CFO practice is I want to be able to take balance sheet, income statement, statement of cash flows, put it in one of these tools, ask it for KPIs, ask it for observations, uh, key variances, things that are different, anomalies, have it come back with a list of 10 things. And then our actual human CFOs, virtual CFOs, will look at that, pick two, three, four that are really meaningful and focus on that. So our virtual CFOs can be much more effective in a much shorter amount of time. And so so I, I think all of these things, though, a lot of it is just in pilot phase. A lot of people identifying use cases and working on use cases. So I think we're just at the tip of the actual impact that this is going to have. So with regards to that component, you're telling CPAs maybe slow down or make sure you've done your due diligence on the security side if you're going to start incorporating it into your system. Is that correct? Yeah. So as, as you're going to experiment, you need to know if you're taking risks, what those risks are. Um, so okay. if, if you've got, and definitely, certainly with client data, you've got to be aware of, okay, how is this going to be used? Do I really understand sort of the parameters around this? Even with your, your meetings, like are there certain meetings that you have AI note takers in? Those are confidential and those need to be treated a different way as right. opposed to, you know, not everybody in the firm should have access to that or that should not be shared externally outside the firm. So definitely, if you haven't put together kind of an acceptable use policy for AI, and as you think about your roadmap and what you're going to get into, that is kind of one of the things from the very beginning, because you, what you don't want to have happen, and this is very important is to go back to the digital natives point, is that if, if lesser experienced professionals don't understand the rules of the road, and they do right. go out and start trying things, that, that could be a problem. So you want to make sure at the very beginning that you're establishing those guardrails and everybody has sort of, yes, we want you to do this, but do it within these parameters. That makes sense. Uh, we, we touched on a topic that, uh, let's put it this way, it's, it's a critical topic, but yet people snooze through it. It's like insurance, right? Which is cybersecurity. Like that's how I treat it because I'm not a, a very tech person. So if you're very into tech, I think that's not a snooze, but I'm going to be honest with you. It's, it's a critical aspect, particularly in our industry. And when you talked about technology, do you also think about that component as well? Is that part of your your process as well, David? Yeah, it, because it's, it's so fundamental, like for technology to be effective and for you to right. use it to its full capabilities. If you don't have the underpinning of the security in place, then it's never going to reach its true effect, its true levels of effectiveness. 
So I think that's that's critically important to make sure that that's part of the overall equation. But I think what is incumbent on people like me and others is to bring cybersecurity forward in a way that is practical, pragmatic, right. and that people can understand. A lot of times there are cyber professionals that you go to one of their presentations, 97 slides, 78 of them are acronyms, and, and you really can't follow, you can't engage. So it, but yeah. it does become a snooze fest. But I think okay. to make it really practical, and that's one of the tips that I share, is to, you've got to make, if you're going to do cybersecurity training for your firm or for clients, you have to make it relevant to their world. So I talk about a lot of things like, you know, publicly known hacks. Do you reuse passwords and talk about the risks of that? Because if people don't really understand the what can go wrong, they'll never take it seriously enough to actually put the level of sure. energy into it that it deserves. So that foundational understanding on, guys, let me tell you some stories. There's some <laughs> bad things that happen. And I've, I've had friends that I'll get a text message and I'm like, oh, no, you did what? And, you know, you have to fix those things. But people need to hear those stories. And that's why, you know, we would never disclose client confidentiality, but just telling stories about somebody wired money here and it cost this small firm $70,000 and here's why. And these are the things that you have to watch out for. The stories is what makes cybersecurity understandable and relatable for people who that's not naturally their thing. Because what I've heard, and this is this might be a little dated, but hackers or organizations or these professional people that are looking for, they, they are targeting CPA firms because the CPA firms have a wealth of knowledge and access because of who we are, what we what we gather, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, have you heard that as well? Is is it is it are we on the hackers' radar now more than maybe let's say five years ago? Do you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think because uh, I, I I think the so yes, that is a correct observation. I do think it's it's critically important. There are bad things that have happened to firms, um, and at Anders we take that very seriously, and we have right. made significant investments at our firm in doing that. But it is it's got to be a holistic effort. It's got to be the technical aspects of it, but more and more of CPA firms, the bad things that are happening are based on human behavior. Because you have right. people who are either sending unsecured documents out that they shouldn't be sending out and you don't have those controls in place um, or just, you know, sharing passwords, other bad behaviors of things uh, that people shouldn't do. So that education is critically important of your your team so that they understand and can fully appreciate the magnitude of the matter. Because you're right, Louie, we are instead of going after one company or one company, if you come after a CPA firm. Suddenly you get hundreds, if not thousands of companies that you get some access and some information that maybe you can use as part of social engineering and, you know, other things that you can do. So CPA yeah. firms are definitely a target and need to be on guard. No, I like, like yeah, because I think uh, uh, from my perspective is, uh, to be quite honest, uh, at one time we weren't on the radar, but I think we are now. And I think... Uh, Unfortunately, we, we're accountants, right? We're not tech people. And I, and I agree with you 100%, especially the small firm, which I'm talking about the, the, the sole proprietor or the one that has three or four staff. Um, you know, I think they should, the elevation of technology and the elevation of security now should be one of the major investments going forward. It's great to hear that you guys are doing it. And, and uh, it's also good to have a guy who was in technology now back in the industry saying, mm -hmm. yes. Cybersecurity is important, right? So that's great to hear. Let's talk a little bit more about the technology aspects of advisory. So one of the things that everybody wants to do is they want to go into advisory. And by the way, we tend to do a lot of advisory services automatically. In my experience, we probably don't charge for it, but we tend to do it, right? But let's talk a little bit about the technology. How can you use technology to actually enhance your advisory services? So I think there's a couple of different ways. So let me just talk quickly about sort of the Anders advisory practice. So Perfect. basically, when you think about, you know, so basically, um, basically half of our advisory practice is our virtual CFO practice. So we've got about 60, 65 people in that practice. And, right. um, and technology is a big part of the delivery of that service because it's virtual. So um, and we have a ton of tools that we've built and we've invested in to really automate that practice. 
So that's a key part of that. But then we also have a part of our advisory practice that is just focused on, uh, it's basically a uh, technology managed service provider, uh, Microsoft consulting, uh, and, and really helping in virtual CIO services. And that's all part of what we deliver as part of that. But then we've got other pieces like our uh, healthcare practice. So a big part of one of the things that we do in healthcare is we do uh, provider enrollment. So basically smaller healthcare organizations are really bad at the process of getting doctors enrolled in insurance plans. So ultimately okay. they don't get paid. So we, we basically outsource that for small uh, healthcare organizations. As part of that, the technology aspect of that is huge as part of, you know, really how we deliver that service. So, you know, part of the point I'm trying to make is it can be its own separate thing, but also right. technology really has to be embedded in everything that you do. There's got to be an emphasis and a focus on it and truly in providing really, you know, world-class advisory services. That's going to be one of the things over the next five to 10 years that's going to really differentiate some firm from others. Have you made those investments? Do you know what it is? And then especially as AI starts plugging in, you've got to have sure. a technology roadmap and you've got to understand in your mind at least how you think all these pieces are going to snap together. You know, you brought up something interesting about your advisory. You kept saying remote CFO. So I think that that's probably where we're going to go. I think the bulk of advisory services aren't going to be face-to-face -face anymore. I mean, uh, I, you, you still have some, don't get me wrong, but if you're going to build a real advisory program, traveling to and from a customer's uh, location, particularly nowadays with all the different communication components you have, tell us a little bit how, because remote's different than face-to-face, -face, right? We, we know that. What kind of things should you prep or promote when you're trying to do a remote type of engagement compared to a more traditional one where they come to the office or there's face to face? Like, what have you experienced and what things we should factor in? Yeah. So so one of the questions is, well, you know, why why should we support remote work? Why don't we just have everybody come to the office? And I think right. part of that discussion, part of that equation, especially as you look at these these different service lines, is that, you know, so so let's say you're a firm and you do you do accounting work, uh, you're basically doing write up work or whatever, and you get three coffee shops in your local community. And suddenly, you know, you've got a nice concentration of coffee shop clients. But then when you look at your addressable market, how many more are there in your local area? Well, you know, there's another two or three, but there's not that many. As opposed to right. when you think nationally, if you can become the coffee shop expert in, right. you know, cash flow forecasting or whatever, then you can sell the coffee shops all around the country. So, so it's a very strategic decision of are you going to be a local player and focus on the local market, which there's nothing wrong with that strategy, but it's very different than if you truly embrace remote work and you do believe that these services can be delivered anywhere in the country and deliver high value. It's just a very different way. And then you've got hybrid in the middle, which we can talk about. Uh, but I think one of the key things about any of these remote services is that you have to be very intentional about sort of it, it's different. And I think that's one of the issues that people struggle with with remote work is there's not sort of a you have to step back and you have to realize I can't take the way that I did it and tweak it a little bit and it'll work for remote. You right. truly have to step back, rethink everything and design a new client experience, a new employee experience for remote work. And that's what I don't think because, you know, when you think back to the pandemic, none of us had a choice. We didn't get to think about it. We just did it. Now, I think we're at a point where people need to step back and, and really figure out, is this designed appropriately to provide this service? Well, not really, because we're missing this, we're missing this. And a lot of times when you think about that, a lot of that can be done with technology. So like, well, normally people come into an office and they physically see each other. Well, right. we need a tool like we have as part of our virtual CFO practice, where it's a, it's a virtual office and you can actually see who's in their office and then you can just knock on their door and it initiates a video chat. And suddenly it's like you're in a physical office, but it's done virtually. That's an example of the type of tools that you have to invest in uh, if you really want an effective remote experience. So th this is one of the things that I've encountered in my mentoring and, and engaging with accounting firms is they feel that the and you mentioned it all related to the employee experience, right? 
when you have the office employee experience and how you manage it in office compared to remote, what I find is the the, tradi- the switch or the, the shift, it's, it's usually hardest on the owners and the managers. And what, what advice do you have with regards? Because the, the traditional way to uh, calculate or determine how well someone is doing is the interaction and also tracking time and hours and, you know, and that sort of thing. When you talk about remote, that's very difficult to do, right? What have you guys incorporated to, to at least have the managers think of, think of remote completely different? Because I don't think you can apply the same measurements yeah. in that category. And, and, it, and you're right. It is harder on the, 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 the supervisors or the managers as opposed to the people, you know, doing the work. Because it right. shifts from, you know, normally if we're in a physical office, I stop by your workstation a couple of times a day. How are you doing? You know, those types of things. And I can see your reaction. Like, are you confident in what you're doing or can I tell that you're just kind of cloudy? So those touch right. points is how how you're able to do that. When you're doing it remote, a lot of you need to figure out, can I still get that same information virtually? Can I just pop? Can we have a quick Teams meeting? Can I use this tool to just pop in and have a quick video chat? Is there, you know, what are the different ways that I can get a handle on whether you're really doing that? But the other thing is there's got to be a different way of, and that's why it's more work on the the leadership, because you have to get better at setting clear expectations. So right. if, if the understanding is by Thursday at noon, we will have these eight things done. And do we all agree that we can have those eight things done by Thursday at noon? Then you can do check-ins and that kind of stuff, but it's very much a by Thursday at noon, that better be done. And I don't really care when you get it done because we're all on different time zones. We all have, yep. you know, some have young kids. And that's one of the great things about this, as long as everybody agrees on what that destination is, but you can't just kind of figure it out as you go. You do have to be intentional and you do have to communicate in a different way than if you were in a physical office. So that that's a great thing. So but if I'm just going to paraphrase, prep work is much more and, and structure is much more required in remote work compared to in office where you can have a lot more impromptu engagement and interaction. Also, too, uh, your staff will ask you questions immediately where they might try to not they might not have that access remote. So prep work. And I think that's great. The The other thing that I the, the biggest complaint I have is, well, it's not a complaint. It's just a natural part of an accounting firm is is we're very dynamic. You know, things pop up. You have those eight things that you just said on Thursday, but between now and Thursday, 15 items came up out of the blue, right? You know that, right? It's just the way it goes. So how do you deal with out of the blue stuff, knowing that maybe the eight things on Thursday might not get done, but there, like, what's the level of communication when you have that dynamic issue yeah. occurring? And it is, and, and you're right, that is the nature of what we do. And there are going to be, if you got 15 things to get done, there's going to be another 30 that aren't on your list that are going to come up. <laughs> So it right. does require that that interaction. But I think, you know, so when I think about, you know, Anders now has multiple locations. The physical office I'm in today is over 50,000 square feet. So right. it's it's not like I only have a couple of people that are just sitting right outside my right. door. So, so what's more effective is basically when those things happen to be quickly grab the two people that you need to talk about so that you're in frequent bursts of communication using Teams, using Slack, whatever your method is, and you're constantly having that interaction. And it's actually more efficient because I'm not walking around the office trying to find people. Rather, (laughs) I'm instantly hitting them and we're all like there. So like when I work from home and I I basically get into my office and I log in and I've got my three monitors, basically I, I can be so much more productive from there because as those things happen, I can sort of react in real time. Send this person a message and say, hey, are you aware of this? Hey, let's jump on a quick video call to talk about this because I think it's going to change our priorities. That's got to become less of walking around and sort of seeing people and more of we're all kind of, you know, working together simultaneously. The downside of that, so that sounds all well and good until you realize the other side of that is Suddenly, you are distracting people constantly, and they can't get anything done because they have constant inter- they have constant disruptions that are coming in. You got text messages, you've got Teams messages, you've got phone calls. Sometimes I feel, you know, our younger professionals, it's a miracle they get anything done 
with right. all of these different pinging and things that's going on. And I think that's another thing that you need to be intentional about in this new system is how are you going to communicate? What is expected? Do we have daily standups? Do we check in two or three times a day? Do we always right. have a 10 minute block in the afternoon at three o'clock where you store up your questions and then you bring them to me every day? It's like there's different ways to handle this, but if you don't think about it and intentionally plan for it, it's not going to happen. So again, you hit it right on the head. Culture, you need, you need, you need the remote culture attitude, I think is one of the things you mentioned, right? Because the familiarity, the comfort level of actually not engaging in person, but doing it with Slack and all that's important to get used to that. And depending on who you are, and where you are, and where you grew up, like where was your experience is if you're an end office manager for 25 years and now you get, there's a bit of a learning curve and I, I perfectly understand that. And the other one is prep, make sure that the engagement and interaction, because now actually what you're saying is you have more focal points than you did if you were in the office. Maybe it was only two, three people. Now that you're in a remote access, there could be 10 people that might want to get access to you. So that that's a well done. Like I, I I think that, but at the same time, you're saying remote's good, right? You're not saying it's bad, right? <laughs> right, right, yeah. But but I, I will tell you, so so if you can get everybody in office and you can find the clients and the people and you can do it in office, that's fantastic. If you're going to do it remote, tons of benefits, but it right. requires work. The real hard thing is when you start getting hybrid. Hybrid is where it gets exceptionally difficult because then you're trying to serve two masters. Are we an in-person firm in the office? Are we a remote firm? That's when it gets really challenging. Okay. So let's let's see if we can spend just a few minutes on hybrid because that's probably the, the norm nowadays. Uh, uh, it's hard to find an employee that for, a lot of employees actually don't want it. Well, because of COVID, don't want to be 100% in the office. They do like the interaction. They like people eventually, right? So they like a hybrid for most, right? If it's possible, unless you live in two different locations. But if you're in the same location, how do you deal with that hybrid? Because nowadays people want two days at home or three days at home or one day at home to work. What do you do there? Like, what, what do you suggest on that one? So it, it is, once again, you have to be intentional about it. You have to design and think through what is that experience going to be like. So for example, a lot of people are like, oh yeah, we do hybrid work and we do it fine. And I'm like, okay, so let's say you have a meeting where you've got in, in office people and you've got remote participants. Tell me about it. And they're like, okay, well, eight of us go and sit in a conference room. And then on the wall, there's two people on the wall. I'm like, okay, so how do you think that experience is for those remote participants? And they think about it and they say, well, it's actually pretty miserable because all eight of us that are in the room, we just kind of talk about stuff. And then the two people, they're just kind of hanging on the wall like a piece of artwork. <laughs> and it, it's like, OK, so that's not going to work. So you have to think about, you know, wait a minute. OK, maybe we're going to eat lunch together and that's something you can do physically together. But then when that's yeah. done, everybody's going to go back to their workstations and we're all going to join the same way so that we all have an equal experience as part of that. So I think there are just so many examples like that of where where hybrid presents some nuances. And suddenly, you know, you're you're doing things in the office. We've got, you know, we're having cookies today or we're having lunch brought yeah. in. What do you do for the remote employees? Do they feel slighted? Do you do special yeah. things for the remote employees? And do, do the in-office employees feel slighted? So I, I do think, though, even though there are challenges, I absolutely think remote work, hybrid work is here to stay. And the primary reason why is because what you mentioned, which is that's what employees want. And it's kind of like, well, we're going to force everybody to come to the office, even though they don't want to. Is that really going to work long term? I just don't understand some of this, the, the forcing people to come back to the office, especially like in metro areas where you're going to spend, you know, an hour in transit and sitting in, you know, bumper, yeah. bumper traffic. And especially the younger generation, that's a big deal for them sort of the sustainability, what you know, what's my environmental impact? If you're forcing them to drive back and forth 30 miles each way, I'm going to tell you, you're under 25 crowd. That's not going to be okay with them. And David, I don't think it's the under 25 crowd anymore. I think it's the, well, the under 50 crowd. Sure. Even the 50 year olds don't want to do it anymore. I mean, yeah. to be honest, right? COVID's woken up everybody. I mean, not just the, the younger ones. I think the people that were used to driving in, doing the one hour commute to an hour and a half sometimes all of a sudden they realize they can do it from home and yeah 
now, now you tell them to come back and I'm like, wait a second here. <laughs> right. So I, I think it, it's right across the board and, and the talent pool, let's be honest, uh, in today's professional, it's hard to find professionals for, for accounting firms. I, 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 we struggle all the time trying to find the right people. So the employees need for a hybrid means that we have to do it. But I think there's a lot of benefits to it. And you brought a lot of them there. The key thing though, like you said, David is, is preparation, planning, uh, make sure it's transparent and fair. And I, I like that. That's really good. And it sounds like Andrew's done a great job on that. Well, I mean, every we, we've done a lot and we've tried really hard and we learn and try to uh, implement fixes as we go. But that is one of the things as part of this, like we'll do something that we think is a great idea. And then six months later, we get employee feedback and it's like, that didn't work. You got to make, you got to make sure that right. you're, you are listening. We do engagement surveys. We, you know, we try to keep the pulse of what everybody's is, you know, thinking, trying to make this the best place to work as possible. Um, yeah. And then as part of that, you just have to be agile. You have to be willing to take feedback, admit mistakes, and change things going forward. So if you want to give advice to the small firm, and I'm talking about the person that has maybe five five to ten employees and, and it's one or two partners, what are the key things for them to think about with regards to um, the remote work and hybrid? What, what things could, should they think about? Well, I think I think it, the first thing you have to start with is is really the strategy, which is what are we going to be? And and with CPA firms, there's in one camp you've got the we're all things to all people, and in our community, any need that they come with for our business clients, we can help them solve that problem. And that right. that's one model. The other piece, which is very uncomfortable, if you started in that camp and switched to this camp, is no, we're going to niche down. So we right. only focus on, we deliver this service and we do it to this particular market and we do it anywhere in the country. Those are two very, very different things. If you're in the, I'm going to serve my local community model, then maybe in office will work for you. Right. If you're going to do the niche down and I'm going to, I'm going to be the expert in digital agencies, which is one of the niches that, that we've got. And we serve those clients anywhere in the country and it's a completely virtual experience. So that the first thing you have to decide is what do we want to be when we grow up? And if you're like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a five person firm today in yeah. three years, I want to be 30 people and here's how I'm going to do it. Okay. For that, you know, there, there's that path to it. But until you make that decision, then you really can't make all the other decisions because uh, you can start trying stuff. But at the end of the day, if you don't know where you're headed, you're probably going to get pretty lost along the journey. And unfortunately, you you experienced this, and you have other colleagues and other firms. They have gotten lost, right? Mm -hmm. And you know the, the 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 signs. I'm working twice as much hours for less money. Uh, can't find people. Customers are you know can't keep up with the customers and so forth. So uh, perfect sense. You know, David, this was fantastic. I I really appreciated uh, talking to you. Um, the things that you brought in are I think very relevant today and particularly for, for accounts and CPAs. And I'm still not sure why you came back, but we're glad to have you back in the accounting industry. I, I, I love this. I love what I do. I love the CPA world. I talk a lot yeah. about the pipeline issues and how we need to fix it. Our younger professionals need to be having a lot more fun than they're having today. So yeah. it's just, it's, it's, you know, technology is a passion too, but sort of the, the, the future of the CPA profession is a significant area of focus for me. And I actually, I think that's really good. If we can have more people who, uh, more CPAs that have um, left and come back, it will help the industry so much more because that that in and out gives you a different perspective completely, right? So It does. I, I think that's one of my secret weapons is because yeah. like, and when I go out and meet with a client, I know how hard their job is because I tried to do it. And when you think about all the things you learn, it's like, oh, here, I'll live in theory and why don't they just do this? Well, you don't understand this person's going through a divorce. This person's got this. Go I mean, there's all these dynamics yeah, and I it has made me a much, much better advisor today than I was before. Well, the only thing I can give advice to CPA firms, if you can find another David, hire and bring him back, it'll help your firm greatly. Thanks, David. Is If there's any way for people that want to get a hold of you or, or get to know uh, or get to ask you some questions, where can they reach? Yeah. Where, where they, can they reach you? Two things I would say. First is connect with me on LinkedIn. 
So I post a lot on LinkedIn. I talk about these types of topics. I talk about AI. I talk about remote work, different observations and things. So definitely connect with me on LinkedIn. So linkedin.com slash Dave Hartley. Um, and then the other is uh, uh, follow Anders CPAs and advisors on social media. Uh, we post a ton of thought leadership. Some of the things that people are even surprised that we give away. Um, you know, we've got our pricing model that's out there. We've got different things that we publish, guides that tell you how to do things. We even coach other firms on how to be a virtual CFO and how to be a virtual CFO practice. So there's a lot of things that we put out there that's really valuable content that people can learn from. So and or CPAs and advisors on any of the socials that you're on, and then me on LinkedIn, linkedin.com slash Dave Hartley. Well, thank you very much, David. Thanks, Louis. David, once again, thank you for joining us today. And to you, our value viewers, thank you for tuning into this episode. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our channel to get great tips and ideas in growing your accounting practice. Until next time, stay hydrated and always be curious. Mm -hmm.